more asset classes. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Ronald Wilcox, author of Whatever Happened to Thrift? Why Americans Don't Save and What to Do About It. Dr. Wilcox, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Hey, in our earlier discussion, you addressed how Americans' irresponsible approach to savings and debt really affects all of us. Tonight, I'd like to take a closer look at addressing solutions to the issue. In general, Americans don't like being told what to do with their money or really anything else. Short of forcing us to save money, is there anything the federal government can do to increase household savings? Well, there's a few things the federal government could do, and one big one would be to shift the tax burden uh, more towards consumption rather than savings or income. Right now, we tax most forms of savings unless it's held in one of these uh, company-sponsored uh, sponsored retirement plans. So I absolutely advocate uh, shifting more towards consumption taxes. Uh, the other thing the federal government could do is really get involved in helping small businesses develop retirement plans for their employees. That is the single biggest gap in the system. That people who work for small businesses do not have access to these kinds of retirement plans. And there's, there are simple steps. There's a lot of proposals being floated out there that the government could take without spending a lot of money that would allow small businesses to develop these kinds of plans. And finally, I'll point out one um, seemingly small thing, but something that would save people a lot of money. Um, people uh, many households hold mutual funds both in their retirement plans and outside of their retirement plans and most people have absolutely no idea on a dollar basis how much those funds are charging them in fees because the Securities and Exchange Commission does not require them to divulge in dollars the amount that they charge. If that were reversed, if, if we had a rule just like we have for green beans at the grocery store where the federal government says if, it's, if it says $1.99, that's what it costs you. If we had the same kind of rule for mutual funds where they had to divulge this in dollars, I think what we would see is people would pay attention to the fees and it would raise price competition in that marketplace. And that would save a lot of people a lot of money. So what kind of tricks can the viewers play on themselves to save more money? Well, there, there, there's two big ones. Uh, one is if you're planning on uh, saving regularly, which is certainly something I would advocate doing, you want to set it up so that you never receive the money to begin with, so that it's automatically deducted from your check. If you create a separate transaction where you're actually writing a check out uh, to a savings provider or a financial services company, we know you're not going to save as much because that's very painful to do once you've held the money in your hand. If you ask most people, can you save more now? What they'll tell you is no, I can't. Uh, you know, I'm really spending everything I have and I can't cut back. But if you tell the same individual, could you divert some of your future raise to savings and get them to sign a piece of paper completely non-binding that says that's what they're going to do, um, a lot of people will stick with that. And the reason that works is because it's much uh, less psychologically painful for us than, than taking money out of our paycheck now because we never see our paycheck go down. We just see it go up by less than what it would have done if we'd have taken all of the raise and put it in our pocket. So that holds a lot of promise for helping people save more money. What do you think is the most important financial concept for young people to grasp when they're just starting to save? I think the single biggest one is compound interest, and I wish that was something that were easy to teach and that everybody understood the mathematics behind it, and they don't. It's not, it's not super difficult, but it's not super easy as well. Um, but I think that the reason that's important is because a lot of people, even early in life, uh, will get online and look at these online retirement calculators and try to figure out how much they need to retire, and the numbers that pop out of those calculators are often mind-boggling to a lot of people. You know, what, what do you mean? I need $3 million to retire. And when they see those numbers, they kind of fall into uh, uh, hopelessness, a kind of paralysis. And they say, well, I might as well not even get started because there's no way I'm going to get to that level of money. Well, we do our part on this show to find new and more effective ways to teach compounding. Ron, what steps can parents take to establish saving money as a habit for their kids? Yeah, that's a really good question, Adam. I, I think uh, there was really a couple of things at play here. One is I'm a big fan of allowances for kids. Uh, the reason I am is because that forces them to make trade-offs early in life 
You know, do I buy the baseball cards now or do I buy the ice cream cone later? Uh, instead of the parents making the trade-offs for them all the time. So it really gets them thinking about saving money now versus spending money now. Uh, the second thing that, uh, that I really believe is, is establishing a separate savings account for kids where they physically get the printout from the bank that shows them how much they have in that account and even more importantly maybe that small amount of interest they're making on the money and those kind of physical experiences where you really see it in front of your face form memories for children and I think those are memories which will serve them well through their lives. Dr. Wilcox thanks again for taking the time to be with us. Oh thanks for having me Adam. Mm -hmm.